Well, personally, I like the atmosphere in which one person screams across the sanctuary to another person, Hey, dude! I actually, I actually think that's a fantastic uh, little faith community to exist in. Um, why don't you, if you have, um, grab your Bible. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one somewhere near you, usually under the seat in front of you or beside you. Why don't you grab a Bible and turn to the book of Ephesians and find chapter 2. And as you're doing that, there are a number of things that we should probably affirm and reaffirm for ourselves this morning. And so by way of I or agree or amen, we can do this. So the first of which is God is trustworthy. Amen. Amen. And as such, he is also omniscient. So, there, was a, there was a hesitation there because it's like part of the congregation was like, I'm actually not sure what that means. All-knowing. So God is all-knowing. Amen? Amen. Um, and he's in his trustworthiness and all-knowingness. Here's the, here's the really important thing. He is um, perfect. Amen? Amen? So with that in mind, all about who God is and how he is and what he is, Let's read a few verses together, and you'll understand why I did that after we're done. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, verse 3, also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We should probably pray. Father, we thank you so much um, for the realization and the remembrance of who you are, even as we affirm your perfectness and holiness, your uh, all-knowingness, Lord, your trustworthiness. I pray that this morning as we consider your word, Uh, that you would give us the ability to trust you and open ourselves to the reality of what you want to say to us. God, I pray that this morning you would, um, as we leave, uh, make us a people who would go out with joy and be led forth with peace, um, (laughs) knowing that you are an amazing God and you have done amazing things. So we thank you again for the opportunity to gather today um, and to talk and to communicate and to look and consider your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Paul, Roman, or excuse me, Ephesians. Okay, I I got confused. Somebody gave me, um, somebody gave me a set of old school commentaries on the book of Romans yesterday. Like, these are books you can't buy, so they're just the old, like, 1950s looking and smelling, like, they smell like a musty library, but, but they, they're, they're fan. Is anybody, nobody else is excited about this? (laughs) Bethany this morning was like, oh, I love how you get excited about old books. And I'm like, yeah, it's an old book. You can't buy these things. And she's like, easy, easy, right? So they gave me a commentary set on the book of Romans. So I have Romans on the brain a little. But in, but in Ephesians, the same guy who wrote Romans, Paul, there's the connection, right? In chapter one, he celebrates or praises the reality of God's grace. And, and that leads him into this, this almost spontaneous description of how he, um, as a leader in the church, prayed for the church, and not just the church buildings, but the the church, the people, and that he prayed for them, that they would, at at the end of it all, or in the simplicity of it all, that they would get to know God better, that they would have the ability from wisdom and enlightenment, they would have the ability to grow closer in their relationship with the one who loved them more than anybody could or would or even could compare. This is what Paul's doing. So then at the, at the end of chapter 1, he flows right into what we call chapter 2. Remember, these letters, when they were written, didn't have the chapter and verse breaks. They were just a letter. And so his thoughts then flow in like Paul often does. He, in a sense, um, though he was a theological genius, he would oftentimes get ahead of himself theologically and then have to go back and unpack it. It's a classic dude thing to do, and it's awesome, by the way, for Bible writing purposes. Amen? Okay, so, so that's what Paul does here. 
like he's celebrating and then he's telling them how he prays for them that they would get to know God better. And then he's like, it's almost as if, and I can't read his or I couldn't read his mind, but I can imagine him as we read Ephesians over and over and over and over. You can almost get into his mind where he's like, yeah, and I'm praying that you have the ability to know God better. And then in his mind, you can almost see a switch go off and go, which is an amazing thing because there was a time where you didn't even know him. This is what's going on in his head before he starts writing chapter two, okay? It's an amazing thing because you didn't even know him and you couldn't know him because you were dead. I should probably unpack that. So he just keeps writing. Are you with me? This is what he does in chapter two, verses one through nine. He just kind of goes on about like don't forget how amazing and do not take for granted your life because it is nothing less than a gift from God. Amen? If we walk out of here today, and I say this every week, right? If we walk out of here today and we get confused about everything, but we know this one thing, that our lives in Christ are nothing less than a gift from God, we'll be in good shape. Does that make sense? In the meantime, I'm going to try to confuse you. Is that, is that fair? I'm not going to try to confuse it. We're going to try to walk through what Paul says. He has this incredible moment where he's talking to these people, and then he reminds them about where they were. And I don't know about you, but the reason we reaffirm the truthfulness, the trustworthiness, and the perfection of God is because this would not be a popular thing to do in the world in which we live. It's not politically correct. It's not nice. It's not sensitive. All of those things. But I suggest to you, within church, within Christianity, and in the context of our faith, It's one of the best things in the world we can do. Why? Well, because as we remember the darkness of the past, the light of the the present, and the love that's filled in filling the present shines even brighter. Is and is even uh, it finds more depth, so to speak. And this is what Paul is doing. Don't forget that Paul would dredge up their dreaded past because their past would be the very thing that would be a reminder about God's amazing grace. Because he goes on in verse 4, just so you know, turn there real quick. He goes on in verse 4 and he says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And, verse 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And I get giddy even as I start reading it because you just can't help it because there's this There's this personal appreciation by me, and I suggest it should be there by us all as we read about the amazing grace that God's love and the difference that it makes in our lives. But in order to properly have gratitude and to be able to not take it for granted, we have to understand what he was doing. It was important for Paul to make sure the Ephesian believers understood where they had been and and, and what that looked like so that they in the present could celebrate all the more. Remember, I've said for weeks now that Ephesians is a long lettered celebration of the love of God. And by Pauline theology, as far as long letters, it's really not that long. But it is a celebration of the love of God. So he reminds them in verses one through three of what they were. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which, in which you used to live. Notice, highlight, underline, you used to live. The inference there is that you no longer live this way. And for all intents and purposes and practical spirituality for both them, them then and us now, you could almost say you do not have to live that way anymore. Like there is a freedom in Christ that has freed uh, uh, believers from the bondage of sin. There's a choice about it. You once were lost, but now have been found. You once were blind, but now you see. You once were dead, but now you are alive. And the aliveness that God has given comes with the ability to choose not to sin. Why? Because we're enslaved or servants of Christ, not the flesh or sin. You used to live this way, he says, and he says, he explains what that looked like when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse three, all of us also lived among them at one time. 
Now, for you and I, church, modern America right now, all of us also once lived among them at that one time. It refers to like a leveling of a playing field. Like we're all in that same, we were all in that same boat. All of us, no matter who we are or what background we come from and where we were. Technically, though, it's more specific than that. Paul is actually referring to when he says at the beginning of chapter 2, you were dead in your transgressions. He's talking about Ephesian believers who by culture um, were Gentiles. In other words, not Jewish, right? And so from, a, from his perspective as a, an expert, a former Jew who was an expert in all things Jewish, the readers could have been like, well, wait a minute, what makes you so special? So in verse 3, he makes sure that they know he's not that special because he says, and all of us also, meaning Jews. This is a big deal, ladies and gentlemen. Jews and Gentiles alike, it literally in that day and age um, was, a, was an expression for all of humanity, was guilty before God because of sin. Jew and Gentile, everyone was in need of a Savior. And Paul's saying we were all in that same boat. Does anybody feel picked on yet? Does any feel, anybody feel like I'm being judgmental yet? Good, hang on, because I'm going to get, I'll, I'll, we'll push it. No, we won't. Literally, we're all in the same boat, Paul says, and that is dead in our sins and transgressions. So, I like to nerd out about these things. I like to look at words, and I like to pick words apart. I have really cool programs on my computers and my phones that allow me to hover over a word like dead and find out what it means. So it was with great anticipation like a week and a half ago that I took my, my little pointer computer with my finger drawer thing, and I, and I hovered over the word you were, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And I was anticipating this great wealth of knowledge coming up from the Greek language that would allow me to wow you with terms terms and terminologies. Dead means, are you ready? Dead. <laughs> I tried so hard to find something there, and it literally meant dead. So for the next few days, I was like, okay, I get dead, but alive. I get it. Like, you know, 40 years ago, maybe we wouldn't have gotten it because, oh, well, maybe 40 years ago you had Dr. Frankenstein and his monster doctor and the Frank, right, right, right? So you're like, oh, the dead walking alive. I get it. Ah, monster. Are you with me? And so for me, I'm like, okay, it's like a walking dead. And I was like, good, throw that in there. You'll speak to millennials and they'll love you for it. And then I was like, okay, boy, I'm really good at these social commentaries. And then I realized, no, 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 it's none of those things, actually. Like, when we, if, we, if we tie it to, like, TV shows and movies, we lessen its effect, to be completely honest. A TV show called The Walking Dead is just that. It's a TV show. It's not real. You know, so I've just offended all of the... <laughs> I've, just, I've offended every male under 30 who lives in Portland. Yeah. All the hipsters are very upset right now. That's okay, they don't watch these videos, so we're fine. But it's worse than that. So I did a little more digging and research. Here's what, uh, here's what dead means. Dead, in, dead because of sin. We're alive, but dead. In other words, what Paul is trying to get across is that in that state, because of sin, all of us, Jew and Gentile, were unalive to God. Does that make sense? Unalive to God. To God. In other words, let me describe it for you. Unable to see spiritually. Spiritually meaning capital S, not just spirituality, right? But spiritually, unable to see the things of God. Unable to hear, hopefully. In other words, unable to hear the things of God and unable to relate rightly. In other words, not just to one another, but to God himself. Now, if we pause right there and we remove the judgmental mindset or sensitivities that we exist in, and we just look at life, maybe not those people out there, but us back then, okay? If we look at that, we would affirm that these things were probably true. Like, there was an unaliveness for, to God. When I was a senior in high school, I was a teacher's aide for the library. <laughs> Best teacher's aide job ever, right? Because I thought, Oh, yeah, I won't have to do anything because no kids go to the library. As it turns out, all the kids go to the library, and they mess up the books. 
And when they mess up the books, I thought it'd be cool, like I get to check books out. And let's be honest, I was a senior, which meant I get to check out all the sophomore girls. Is that too, too honest? But all the sophomore girls were busy messing up all the books. And so then the librarian said, Darren, you're my aide. After they leave, I want you to go straighten up all the books. I didn't think checking out all the sophomore girls meant cleaning up after them, but there it was. And one of the sections I had to keep clean and straightened up was the spirituality section. And there was a, there was a part of my heart that wanted to know why, what, how, all of this stuff. So I started day by day looking at books. I looked at a book on Rastafarianism because I thought dreadlocks and smoking weed was cool. And if there's a spirituality connected to those things, I'm in. And then I just kept reading, and they don't take showers and something like that. And I thought, I'm back out. So, <laughs> so then I pick up a book on you name the world religion and everything. I couldn't, I, I literally, it's, it's, it's a sound overly dramatic for a 17-year-old kid, but I was literally frustrated because I could not break through that longing. Whatever book I read on spirituality couldn't be satisfied. Do you know why? Because ultimately I was unalive to the reality of God, to the real God. And no matter what I read and no matter what I, I didn't hear, see, or have any hope in it all, and I was actually super bummed out after it. But thankfully, at some point, God came in. You see, as a result of being unalive to God, Eugene Peterson says this, we let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell us how to live. We filled our lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it, all of us, doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. Eugene Peterson's way of describing the unalive to God life. Now, at this point, we have a choice. Preaching-wise, we, we have a choice. We could go the old school hellfire and brimstone route and talk about undead life or dead life, unalive life, and rail against all the worldly passions and positions and satanic influences and get all kinds of, right? But ultimately, I think Paul was doing something even more significant than that. Should we understand the spiritual realities in life? Paul describes of it, all of us, uh, well, he's, he describes it in verse 2 when he says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. I got news for you. Every scholar that I've ever read agrees that that's Satan, that that's a reality. There are spiritual realities. There are spiritual wars going on. There are, whether it's cliche or judgmental or not, there is a worldview way of living that is less than God. Uh, Paul would use the language that is unalive to the things of God, and we were all in that boat. Eugene Peterson described it. We were, we were, we were inhaling disbelief and then exhaling disobedience. We were all there. We should be aware of that spiritually, sensitively, but Paul was being even more personal. He wasn't just trying to give us ammunition so that we could go out and rail against the unbelieving world and the community filled with people who were exhaling disbelief to the detriment of all humanity. That's, like, that's not necessarily what his purpose was in writing. Instead, his purpose in saying all of that was to get us to verse 4. And in verse 4, he says, but, when, but, then, but, this was reality, but, I just said but a lot, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus." I think Paul is having us remember where we were so that the reality of what he has done is highlighted even more. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you in on some preacher tricks, okay? Highlighted even more. I, I lifted my leg. I'm going to even come down here. Look what I've done. Look, I've, I've actually highlighted even more the things that God has done. It's not just speech, ladies and gentlemen. These are pretty technical. Isn't that cool? No. It's not as cool as skateboard party. I get it. Listen, we've actually highlighted the things of what, that God has done, and this is literally, honestly, this is what God's getting to, right? It's the old story of the, the, the beauty of a diamond is most appreciated against the blackness of the cloth. Are you with me? Right? 
That's what Paul's doing. He's described the blackness of the cloth of our old way of living. Note that, in which you used to live. We're no longer supposed to be living that way because it's bad and it'll do bad things to you. No, like that's one way of looking at it, <laughs> right? But that's not what Paul's saying. He's saying you don't live like that anymore because you're now under the control of something and someone and someone greater than that. It's different, right? It's not just that's bad for you, and it is because it makes you dead. You're now under the control of the one who makes you alive, Amen. which is really good, by the way. Like, we're all breathed in, people. Ah. <sighs> We breathe in belief, according to Eugene Peterson. If the opposite is true, then we have the opportunity every moment to breathe in belief and exhale obedience. This is what Paul's talking about. It's awesome. I told you three weeks ago, it's going to be one long celebration. I did promise the elders that I would level off, not this week. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> Look at what he does in chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. He highlights what he has done. But because of his great mercy and his amazing love, great mercy, when he uses the term because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. These are terms, right? If you hover on my computer program on those terms, these are terms which describe a love that is beyond our ability to completely comprehend. So it requires faith. Are we okay with that? It's a love, and the reason why we can't completely comprehend it is because we have been conditioned to comprehend so much less. Are you with me? Life in this world, like when we were dead, right? Unalive to God in this world, there was love, but it was less than God's perfect, amazing, absolutely unbelievable love. And so we've been conditioned to just live according to that less than love. And yet, because of God's greater than all of that love, we have the ability to, 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 to be different, right? To really actually be alive. And we have to break through the conditioning that we've done. Because sometimes when you say, hey, God loves you, people can connect that to all kinds of weird things. If you're a junior higher, you connect it to like, at worst, pizza. At best, the boyfriend that's here today and gone tomorrow. This is love. You start talking to somebody in their 30s about love, and then it's kind of tainted by their experiences in their 20s, right? I suggest to you, we just, if you want to know about love, talk to somebody that's like 90. <laughs> they get it. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? This is Paul's, he's talking about this greater than kind of love, but because of this love, and, and, and the term love, he uses the term agape, and we've all heard this term, yes? Right? Agape love, this God love, this selfless love, this sacrificial love, this not like us love, right? This perfect love. But I, I discovered that it also means this, a kiss of peace. Because of God's kiss of peace upon our life, like there's this living <laughs> and and life looks different now he has look at what he says in verse five he's, he says he has made us alive with christ even when we were dead in transgressions alive with christ dead in transgressions we were dead because of our transgressions and now because of because of the the kiss of peace of god his love upon our life we are now alive we have been revived from the dead we're now not unalive to God. We are now alive to God. In other words, we can now hear and see and perceive the reality of his life through his spirit working through us. Have you ever been driving down the road and, 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 and it would have been normal for you to behave in a certain way way back when, but then all of a sudden there was this day and you're just driving down the road and when normal behavior would have looked like a middle finger, there's a point where you think, I'm not going to do that today. Let me ask you a question. Is that because of your ability to get better and be a good person? Or is that nothing less than the reality of being revived and alive to the Spirit of God living within you where you realize that's probably not in keeping with the culture that Christ commands? Are you with me? You guys experience this all the time. Part of our job is just to help us be able to connect it with everyday real life so we see, oh, the fingerprints of the Father are all over my life. All you got to do is a little investigative dusting, and you'll see it. 
And when you'll see it, it's amazing because God's there. He's revived us according to verse 5. Keep going. It also says at the end of verse 5, he has, he has made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And then he says, it is by grace that you have been saved. He has rescued us. <laughs> Here we go. He has rescued us from Satan. From Satan. The Bible talks about it, so we might as well talk about it. It's not just rescued us like, oh, you were rescued. You rescued us from this, un- this ambiguous idea of sin. No, 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 no. He has rescued us in the flow of the language. He has rescued us from, from, from like, he's freed us. He's, he's gone to battle with. He's climbed the wall. He's gone into enemy territory, and he has freed you from, host- from being a ho- held hostage. <laughs> I'll get the words right. Give me time. From being held hostage by nothing less or one that was by by Satan, the enemy. And then not only that, he throws you on your back and he reclimbs the wall and he runs off into victory. And all the while we're like, oh, this is what living is really like because before it was this and this and this. And then he says, no, I'm going to not only revive you, I'm going to make you alive and I'm going to bring you back from the spiritually dead, but I'm also going to rescue you from the clutches of the one who, according to Jesus in John chapter 10, who would like nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy you. But we just go through life going, yeah, I'm a Christian. It's kind of bummer I can't do this. I mean, sinning used to be so much fun. I don't do it anymore because I'm a good believer. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus Christ himself did not give his life, right? (laughs) Die as a perfect sacrifice and then be resurrected on the third day so that we could go through life as believers who go, yeah, I mean, I used to sin, and gosh, let me tell you about the good old days. You've been around those testimonies, right? No, the good old days are the days that are before us. Like, those are the good days. He's actually rescued us from the clutches of an enemy that the Bible refers to as Satan who would like nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy us. John chapter 10. We're free. Yes. There's a good... You guys are from Houston, right? There's a little... No, I'm sorry. From Southern California. There was something southern in that, either way. But that's the beauty of it. He goes on, verse 6, I'm sorry, I'll just keep going. Verse 6, he says this, um, if I could find verse 6. I I woke up, can I have a personal moment? I woke up and I told, yeah, I'm going to have it. You guys can pray, something's going on in my sleep. I woke up this morning and I told Bethany I had a nightmare last night. The nightmare was I walked up in front of this church, which by the way had grown to like 50,000 people. Of course, it's a preacher dream, (laughs) right? And and I walked up and I was supposed to talk about Ephesians chapter 2, this passage, and I I walked up and I had my, what I thought was my Bible, but it was really like um, a a leather-bound Bible dictionary. And I walked up and like for the life of me, I couldn't find the book of Ephesians. And what went on for like 45 hours, I couldn't find Ephesians. And there were people like you guys staring at me with judgment in your eyes, like, what is your problem? How come you, I can't believe you're the pastor. And all of this was going on in my mind. And Bethany asked a simple question. (laughs) She's like, well, why didn't you just tell him you forgot your Bible? (laughs) Because it's a dream! (laughs) So when I said Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and then I couldn't find verse 6, I started to panic a little, but this is real life, and here's verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Not only has he revived us and rescued us, but he has raised us to... with Jesus. Now, this, these terms are interesting because there is a not yet um, view of this term that means that there will come a time at the end of this age where we will, as believers, be seated with the one who saved our souls. Now, what that looks like and how that works and, and the glory of all of that is it's described throughout the scriptures, but for me to simplify it um, would do, it, do an injustice to it. It's going to be amazing. But the right now aspect of it is this. In Jesus, he has raised our ability to live life. 
And he's using human terms that we can understand. They're not judgmental terms. They're just practical, observational terms. He has raised us up out. Psalms 40 refers to it out of the muck and the mire of this worldly living, this low living, this, this disobedience that Eugene Peterson talked about. He has raised us up out of that and given us the ability in Christ to live differently. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3, verse, verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above and not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul is saying now, because you've been made alive, you have had your lives raised to the point to where you can hear and see and perceive and have hope in the things of God. He continues on in verse 7, and he says this. He's raised us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. He is, he is, he is revealing the glory of his grace in Christ through us. That's part of what what he's doing our aliveness to God, our once was dead, but now I'm alive reality of life. I once didn't believe, but now I believe. The purpose in that is that our living might showcase and show off the glory of God's grace in Christ. We are to be a living billboard for the Almighty. We are to be a living representation and advertisement, if you will, advertisement. It's how the English say it. I talked to an English lady yesterday, and it's rubbed off. We are to be a living manifestation of the love of God through Christ or in Christ. In other words, there is supposed to be, according to Matthew chapter 5, there is supposed to be a, 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 a light coming from our lives. There's supposed to be a difference. It's supposed to be perceptible. It is as if God was saying, look what I've done. Take your life. Have you ever thought about yourself like this? I touched on it a few weeks ago, where God sees us as holy and beloved, where quite often we see ourselves, and we've been told by the church just to see ourselves as wretched sinners saved by grace, which is true, but then you're holy and beloved, right? Have you ever thought about the reality of that you're walking, let's say you're just walking through, I don't know, the mall, and you're walking through there at, I don't know, Christmas time, a time where it's all about Jesus, and you're walking through the mall at Christmas time, and there's tons of people there? Have you ever looked at, like, the, have you ever taken the time to think of it from God's perspective, and there's the reality that God is going, everybody, look at him, because when you look at him, you'll see my love. Look, he was just nice to the cash register lady. He just smiled at the stranger. He just helped a little old lady. He just said, do you you ever look at life like that? I don't. I get on my bike or I go about my day going, oh, people are annoying, right? (laughs) But not me. People. (laughs) So that's the way I go about my life. But but verse 7 says that Jesus, like God, has taken you from death to life, and he's done so to to, to reignite realistically use you and I, the Ephesians, and all who would believe as, as, a, as, a, as a, for lack of a better term, an advertisement of his glory and his grace and his love. We are the mission, right? We are the, we are the missionaries. We are the ones who shine bright like a diamond for the glory of God. Keep going. It was a song lyric, I'm sorry. Keep going, chapter, eight, chapter 2, verse 8, and we'll, we'll end with this. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one should boast. Paul ends this whole little passage by saying, by helping us to remember what we did not do. Not only remembering what God, where we were and what God did, but also he ends it with, and don't forget what you didn't do. <laughs> There's a humility thing here because we did not earn our salvation or deserve his devotion. All that he has done, verses four through seven, that aliveness, the revive, the rescue, the raising, the revealing, all of that is by grace in Christ through faith that comes from the Spirit. I mean, it's never as a result. I can never boast about my own spirituality. Instead, the unfolding story of my life should proclaim, should proclaim his unbelievably gracious ability. 
It's by faith that you've been saved through grace, or it's by grace through faith that you've been saved so that no one could boast. Instead, we would simply proclaim the ability of God. Now, what does that have to do with you and I now? Well, I think it has to do a lot, because even as we consider communion, even as we prepare our hearts to do what we do every week, to take a little piece of cracker, a little, little cup of juice, and remember the sacrifice of Christ, like it's real, ladies and gentlemen, that we should remember and be thankful and be alive. Does that make sense? That we should remember what God has done. And because of where we were, we should be the most thankful people on the face of the planet. And the best thing that we could do, according to Romans chapter 12, is be alive. Like submit, our, submit ourselves as a living sacrifice. To be alive to God. To be alive to the Spirit. Let's go back to that unalive state that we should often, as we remember communion and what God has done, we should be motivated to see with spiritual eyes, to be able to recognize what God is doing and how He's doing and what He wants to do, to hear with, with ears that hear hope, not just see bad situations and wash your hands of them, but to see that God can work in the midst of any and every situation. Why? Because we're alive to the one who raised us from the dead. And if he can do that, remember last week, we were all somebody's personal prayer impossible project that are now possible. Do you see what I mean? We are all the reality, a living testimony of God's ability. We should hear the world around us with hopeful ears that God can and will and is working. We should listen and, and, and relate with one another rightly because we've been rightly related to God. This is what we should be thankful for, all of these opportunities. Why? Let me just read a passage to you, Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. We have a new life to live. And Paul would say, get busy living it. And if, lest we forget that we have the opportunity to live this life, because Christ gave his. Let's stand for just a moment as the worship guys, gals, as Josh and Becky come back up. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes just for a moment, just for the sake of focus. As I've stated before, our liturgy here at the church is pretty repetitive. And part of that's on purpose, that we would grow through these repetitions in our love and our appreciation for what God has done. But we have the chance this morning to remember how this was all accomplished. That it's not just words in Romans or Ephesians, but 2,000 years ago, the Son of God came and He lived and He died and He was raised again on the third day. All of that to accomplish the requirements for our righteousness that God had declared. We should never come to communion without a willingness to be thankful for all that Jesus has done. And to remember that, and not, also, not only just to remember that, but to remember to be thankful and to be alive. Josh is going to play a song, and 
he and Becky are going to lead us in some singing. And as they do, some folks are going to come and pass out these elements. And I would encourage you to remember the love of God through communion this morning. But I would also encourage along these lines, if you're here and you've never actually believed in the reality of what God has done for you, and part of your unwillingness to believe it is because uh, we, quote-unquote, as the church has been judgmental in communicating it. Uh, forgive us for being judgmental, but we have to proclaim the truth. And my hope is that if you're here and you don't know the Lord, you've had the opportunity to hear part of the truth today. That your sin, struggle, and problem has been paid for and taken care of by a God who says that he loves you very much. And if that's you, I would encourage you, even as the elements come by, grab them and hold on to them and believe based on on what he has done for you. And then you eat and you drink because you are, even in that moment, recognizing that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that you might believe and become alive again. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for a few verses that stir our souls and encourage our hearts, but also, Lord, that jog our memory banks a little bit. We thank you for reminding us about all that you have done. And I pray that even through these communion elements, that we would embrace those memories, that we would believe in the reality of what you have done for us, and that we would live for your glory in your honor. In Jesus' name. As we sing together, take the elements, and as you do business with the Lord, and when it seems right according to the Spirit, go ahead and eat and drink in the remembrance and recognition of what Jesus has done for us all. Amen. Thank you for listening to our podcast. For more information about Rogue Valley Christian Church, visit our website at www.rvchristian.com.